Good evening and welcome to another edition of Inside the Issues, um, sponsored by the League of Women Voters Richfield. My name is Maureen Scalia and I'm the moderator of the program. Tonight we are very honored to have with us the chair of the Three Rivers Park District, uh, John Gunyu. And uh, John, I'm glad you take time out of your busy schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're retired, but you, <laughs> a little less I'm busy than it was. <laughs> yeah, you're not as busy as you were. And welcome to the show. Um, we're happy to have you. And uh, we'll talk about something that's near and dear to my heart: the parks and the trails of this wonderful metropolitan area. Uh, before I get going, John, tell us how you end up chair of the Three Rivers Park District. Well, my, kind of uh, your background a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> well, in a nutshell, my 94-year-old my mother calls me her son who can't hold a job. Oh. So I've, <laughs> I've done a lot of things in my career. I mean, it was from, uh, oh, I was once the state finance commissioner under Arnie Carlson. I was the first finance director in Minneapolis. Uh, oh, when we right. moved here about 30 years ago, I grew up in a little farm town in Ohio. I used to be run the holding company for MPR at one point, ran an internet company. Uh, I retired as the Minnetonka city manager uh, okay. three years ago, and there was an open seat on the Three Rivers Park board, and someone suggested that maybe you ought to run for that. And I, I said, well, you know, I really am retiring. I get out of government and all. And, but then I thought, you know, the good thing, the thing I always liked the most about being in government was parks and trails. Oh. And this was a way to just deal with that and not all that other stuff that, yeah. you know, that I have yeah, to that's... deal with. So it's been a really interesting uh, and a, a fun time to join uh, such a well-regarded district. We're very unique in the country. Yeah. Um, so what is Three Parks? Three River Parks, yeah. I should say. Well, that, well, first of all, what are the three rivers, I guess? Well, there's the, there's the question. I always ask people if they can name the three rivers that we um, are. Mississippi, Minnesota. Those are the two easy ones. Yep, and everybody, then the Crow. That's right. You know, a very small percentage of people get the Crow. It, it's really the, uh, the rivers that border the, the area we serve. We serve everything in those watershed districts. So the the Crow on kind of the north and west, and the, the Mississippi on kind of the north and east, and then the Minnesota River and the, and the south. So the south. We, we renamed ourselves oh, a few years ago because uh, we used to be the Hennepin Park Reserve years ago. We're, oh, we're over yes. 50 years old, but it was, uh, yeah. we do things way beyond just Hennepin County now, so we, we thought that was a more apt description. Oh, yes, because I recognize that term from the past. And yeah, some of that's, that's the reason I haven't heard it lately. <laughs> well, you date your, people date themselves by saying, oh, Hennepin Parks. Yeah, <laughs> we actually have uh, very little connection with Hennepin County. We serve suburban Hennepin County and kind of the surrounding areas, but we have our own independently elected board. Uh, the county actually does appoint a couple people on our seven member oh, okay. board, but we have our own taxing authority. Uh, we operate much like any government, but we focus only on parks and trails. Um, I suppose the other thing that makes us unique, there's only a few like us in the whole country. They have, a, they have an annual conference of, of places <laughs> like us, and it's, you can hold it in one small hotel. I think <laughs> there, there are not that, many, not, uh, that that, many. not that many organizations like us around the country or even in Canada. But we're, uh, I like to tell people we have, the, uh, we have the big parks and the big trails. So we, we work very closely with, uh, with city park and rec departments, but we focus mainly on the larger parks. So give you an idea, we have about 22 regional parks. Uh, we have uh, 27,000 acres of park reserves. So yes. we're very much environmental preservation oriented. Not, we don't do ball diamonds, things like that. We work, like I said, in conjunction with, with the local local park and rec departments. Yeah, and then I suppose, too, many of the trails are really inter-city. Inter inter I mean, it's like um, Nine Mile is yours, isn't it? Yes, that's, uh, that was actually, we opened that in Richfield, through yes, Richfield. Yes, we were the first leg of it. Yep, that was the first leg, and that's, we're really excited about that trail. In fact, we, uh, we had a groundbreaking recently, and it was pouring rain. In fact, we, it was pouring so much I had to shout to be heard Across. The, in, within the tent we were standing in. But we, we had the groundbreaking for the, um, for the Adina portion, which will be the last segment. 
So we did we did Richfield actually a, a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, and two, three. And uh, to kind of give you an idea about how complex these projects have become, is uh, you had to put together all these funding part. We had to put together all these funding projects to. Uh, partnerships to pull this together. So Richfield turned out to be one of the first because the Met Council uh, Metro Sewer yes. organization was putting in a new interceptor. And so we thought, well, there's an opportune time to at the same time put in a trail because once you, we don't need a lot of width to put that in. So if they're tearing up big sections, so we did Richfield uh, opened a couple of years ago. Uh, we did Hopkins in connection with the Nine Mile Creek Watershed District was doing some bank stabilization uh, oh, just a year sure. ago. And so at the same time, we put our trail in at that time. Edina was a little tougher because it's going along most of the creek. Uh, we were very fortunate in that we, uh, uh, when uh, the Edina mayor called me after I was elected three years ago and said, so when is this trail planned? I checked into it and he said, gee, that's that's quite a few years out and I said well let me let's talk with my fellow commissioners let's talk with staff and what we ended up doing we were able to advance it a couple of years oh. um, because uh, we decided by moving around some of our funding priorities we could also leverage a lot more federal grant funding through the Metropolitan Council so it was kind of the best of all worlds we're going to get the trail uh, sooner and we're going to get it uh, with more federal support to, to build these to build oh, these nice. things. So it's a it's becoming you have to be sort of a financial wizard to put all these things together anymore to get them done. Well, and then the whole Southdale area is how in the heck are where are you coming through there? Do you know? Off well, there? we have some pretty major grade separations. Yeah. So at the the first section is going to be built in that area. So uh, people that are riding on the Richfield Trail will not have to stop at the border like they do now. <laughs> oh, so yes. so uh, we're actually, we let the contracts for the construction, that'll start uh, yet this fall, and it'll go through, so we have to, obviously we have to get across, uh, you know, we have to get across uh, through France, we have, to, we have to do Highway 100, we have to do 169, uh, and then we'll be building west as That's we do this. Uh, the first segment will go to the high school, and then uh, the second segment will kind of go from there on. But we have, uh, some pretty major grade separations where you know if you have to get across these major, major highways you know, it'll be a combination of either either an underpass or, or an overpass in, in those areas it's uh, to give you an idea this is a great example of a trail that um, it's been a long time in the making but it really completes a real segment for us to get up into the Hopkins connection and the uh, the Hopkins depot it was, which is aptly named, the, the old railroad depot. Oh, a lot of our, our trail segments in this southern area meet there. So it's kind of the hub of the trail system like it used to be a railroad. Railroad, <laughs> railroad hub, yeah. Um, and uh, this will be a major link, and we expect it to be heavily used by, uh, by two different user groups. One is uh, commuters. So uh, very, we, we expect hundreds of thousands of people to use this the first year it's opened. And it's, uh, it'll be a combination of people uh, dry, you know, riding to where they want to get, whether it's work, shopping, the library, school, which is our fastest growing segment. Um, over four million of uh, people use our trails in, in three rivers every year. And, and the other piece is we think it's going to be a beautiful link so yes. that people will go there, much like our Dakota Rail Trail, if you're familiar with that. Um, that's a, a, a trail that people go to because it has such beautiful uh, scenery is as that you go the one, through it. Well, wait, now I'm getting mixed up. Dakota is on the east. Is that one kind of following? What, it's not Dakota County. It's the Dakota Rail, which oh, is, yeah. Oh, that's... It's uh, up through Plymouth and kind of in the northern section Oh, the that's northern the one that goes there. north then. North of the lakes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then all these trails feed into like the Cedar Lake and all that, so we have... A lot of commuters, we, we work closely with the Minneapolis Park Board. Because they, they're connecting with the in. Minneapolis bikeway system. Big part of what we're doing is most of our trails historically have been built east-west uh, because those were the easiest ones to put in. They're along the old rail lines. And sure. you might notice we, we have that name in our title. It says LRT Trail because the county acquired that land and then uh, leases it to us uh, very cheaply to let us use that. Uh, oh, to put nice. the trails in, but we don't have as many north-south connections. So you, 
tend to have to ride out and back. Now, in particular, uh, Richfield and Bloomington that the, your viewers might want to hear is we're opening up a new trail, which will be, uh, we open next year. This is our, uh, our Nokomis uh, uh, Minnesota River uh, Trail. So it'll run north-south along the uh, Richfield border, yeah. actually. And we just got the approval for the last little piece of that uh, through the city of Richfield. We work very closely with all the cities to do that. So that will connect, um, will connect the Nine Mile Creek Trail up to the, uh, the Grand Rounds by uh, Lake Nokomis. So you can ride in a, in a very large loop around the whole southern, southern metro area. And biking is becoming just a very popular thing to do in oh, yeah, absolutely. Minnesota. I mean, considering that we have winter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're one of the top biking areas of the country, which you wouldn't guess because of the winter. But you people know, ride all year round. Absolutely. And, and uh, you'd be surprised at how many people commute during the winter. Yes. So then, so it's become a challenge to us in working with the local communities to keep the trails open so that people can continue to use them uh, during, the, during the winter. We, have, uh, we serve probably about 11 million people every year in a variety of things. Uh, trails are over 40% of that oh and by God. far our fastest growing segment. And some of these commuters uh, and some of our trails, that represents half of all the people that use their those trails. It's not just people that are using it for recreational. recreational. You know, another example that kind of in the same area is we just acquired, um, I don't know if you remember Camp Kingswood. It was, a, it was a, um, an old Methodist church camp out uh, in uh, Little Long Lake, out uh, in Minatrista in that oh, area. Out there. Okay. So we acquired that a couple of years ago. That'll be one major link in a north-south trail we're going to build out on the western portion that we, we serve. Well, is so, there any way to just take a ride around Lake Minnetonka? Is that, is, are there trails that are going by Minnetonka? Really good question. And so these, we have trails that run the Dakota Rail and the Loose Line run on the north side of the lake. We have uh, the Lake Minnetonka LRT Trail that runs on the south part of the lake all the way out to Victoria now and beyond. And then uh, this trail that I was talking about, which will be several years in the making because we haven't acquired all the property, will be the far end of that. The, the other piece that uh, we're kind of excited but will eventually happen, I'm not sure it'll be in, in uh, my tenure, but <laughs> <laughs> it's um, on Highway 19 uh, through kind of the middle of the lake through uh, yeah, Shorewood. Yes. Uh, that's a natural connection to the north-south kind of halfway with the Lake Minnetonka, but we'll do that when the county reconstructs that road, which is not in the immediate, immediate future, future, but uh, that's really what we try to do, is we try to do these things that are um, opportunistic. You know, yeah. if, a, if a development is going in, we, we work with the city and we say, can we reserve some of that land so that when we get to that point, we can put the trail through. Uh, the county we work very closely with, they're putting in a new road. We said, we'd like to take another 10 feet, <laughs> you know, yeah. if we could, while you're putting in the road so that we can make sure we have a trail in at that point, so. Well, it, it makes sense. I mean, first of all, it's a recreation on riding, and obviously that keeps people physically fit, which is oh, yeah. a real need in our area. And, you know, the more, the less pollution from cars, the better it is. So it's a win-win all the way around. Well, we talked a lot about trails. We probably should say that you've got some lakeshore property or areas <laughs> also. What, uh, what kind of lakes, just throw out some general uh, lake names and what city they're in, maybe for the people to see the whole gamut of what we cover in the three... Uh, rivers district. Well, if, if you think about what we do, uh, I mean, you know, our, our northern borders are uh, the Crow River. Uh, and so we, all the way up into, we have uh, equestrian areas up there in our less developed parks that are out on the, on the Crow. We have some major trails that are going in, in, uh, in you know, sort of that area, I mean, through Rogers and uh, north of and Maple Grove and those areas. One of our largest parks in that area that many people are aware of is Elm Creek oh, in that area. Right. So we have a, it's one of the, one of our gems in the system. Uh, we're doing a lot of work uh, now. In fact, one of our major priorities 
is the um, is the Coon Rapids Dam. Uh, we actually own a dam. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so you have things. the dam. Yeah. I'm not sure how we ended up with that, but a number of years ago, I think the legislature said you uh, you, you can get us there. We have uh, we have property on both sides, and uh, we just uh, we just completed with uh, federal state funding, uh, replacing some of the gates on that dam that they were wearing out. Uh, so we so have you're a trail. You're going to keep it as a functioning dam. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it's a major barrier. Uh, for the invasive species on the That's on the right. river, but then uh, we're we're working with all the with the communities in the area and the neighbors to redevelop kind of what's there. So uh, the types of programming that we have offered in that area will be will be changing. You know, uh, and Maureen, that's one thing maybe I could mention. Uh, was, I was going to um, say we got to talk about that programming. Piece. Sure. Um, so. One of the things that we uh, we had a every political board has a retreat from now to now, not from time to time. Uh, although I will say when I, I once worked in Minneapolis and we used to call those advances because uh, rather than retreats. Oh, so I, I see. Yeah, I, know. Yes. Yeah, I, I never thought that caught on very well. But anyway, <laughs> we had a retreat. So um, the, the top priority of the, of the Board of Commissioners, and I'm just one of seven, um, is, to, is to do uh, a, a much better job of reaching people that we haven't traditionally served. And if you think about, uh, if you think about what that means is that we were founded and in our many early years and decades, we, we preserved a lot of uh, land and open space and, uh, and that's really what our, our mission is all about. Um, education and natural resource uh, preservation, recreation with that emphasis on environmental protection. Um, but a lot of our, our parks and our nature centers that are, I mean, second to none in those areas are located in those sort of uh, more outlying areas. Yes, uh, but we serve a much greater area than that. So that what the board decided, they said we really, uh, we really need to do more in the first tier suburbs. So what that means is it means the Richfields and the Hopkins and the Rob, um, you know, Robins, uh, Robbinsdale and the, um, uh, oh, the Crystal New Hope and the Golden Valleys and all those, those areas that we traditionally haven't had active services. So what we've been doing is we've uh, been developing one by one relationships with each of those communities to do, do some common uh, programming together, work in. Now it's we're not in a position. We're not going to be buying hundreds of acres of land in full, no, fully developed in communities. <laughs> that would be a that'd be pretty cost prohibitive. But a good example is we met with uh, met with Mayor Godel and uh, and uh, her city manager and uh, and the parks parks director in in Richfield, and uh, sat down and said, well, what can we do together? And they said, well, you know, we have some uh, we have some nice parks here. Uh, that serve areas that, uh, but we don't have this sort of programming of like the like the animals and the natural yes. resource and things like that. Uh, very, uh, there's a great you know uh, nature center that yes. Richfield runs their yes. own, but there are some things that we can provide that they don't. And we said, well, you know, rather why don't we talk about uh, some summer programs in one of your parks? So uh, we would bring our, in fact, we have something we call Parks on the Go. We bought a van uh -huh. that says Parks on the Go on the outside. And I call it the, the bookmobile with an owl. Uh, so <laughs> with not, the real owl. Yeah, with a real owl. Not the Harry Potter's you know, owl. And a lot of people don't remember what bookmobiles were, but I, <laughs> I of course, do. But, um, and so what we can do then is take that programming. We can run a week-long camp in... Sure. Um, Roosevelt Park. I mean, we can do things that in a local park uh, that the city might not be able to do. And so we're reaching kids that way that we might not normally see. We're uh, establishing more relationships with the school districts as a natural. Yeah. Uh, and also senior, uh, senior centers. So if you, if you think about kind of all the programming that goes into uh, seniors that maybe don't have as much uh, mobility, and flexibility is how do we work with with those centers and bring people in. A good example is we also uh, we also own a historical center. I don't know if, if, if the, the landing that used to be Murphy's Landing oh, yeah, out in Murphy's. Shakopee. Yeah, that's ours too. So we somehow we ended up with the land. <laughs> the dams and historical centers. 
<laughs> okay. So it's a great place to go. I mean, you know, well, well in fact, uh, you know, we have a, a Halloween program out there. We have Veterans Day. We have the Fourth of July. All those kind of programs. And it's a, if if you've never been there, it's just a great place to go. It's. I uh, keep forgetting. It's one of the places I want to go, and I just keep, you know, forgetting to put that on the calendar. Oh yeah, but if you think about it, uh, so uh, people that are maybe have less less uh, access to those that we can, you know, we we can bring those people in to talk about historical issues maybe with some of the senior centers that that yeah. like that kind of like that kind of programming so it's a it's a little different approach uh, than historically we've done we have a lot of land we have a lot of uh, nature centers we have a lot of parks and programs which we absolutely take great pride in and will not abandon what we're thinking about is how can we bring more of that to people that maybe haven't historically had as much access to that. And then I can think of like the one of the um, you know summer youth programs getting on a bus and bringing the kids out. Yep. You know, totally away from the city. <clears throat> and we do a lot of that. I mean it's uh, you know the the bug camps are really Blood really camps. popular. I mean, you can imagine these little kids Bugs. running through these, uh, you know, the weeds with, you know, with with nets oh, and that's what it's, uh, and it's a combination of that. You know, it's it's how can we uh, do do both? Because if you think about historically, schools used to do a lot of field trips. Yes. Fewer and fewer of those are happening with you know financial challenges yeah. and all that. So. Uh, our philosophy is it's easier for us to bring a couple people in to talk about nature to the school uh, rather than have, you know, bust the whole, you know, 30 kids out and do that. Um, a combination of those two. Yes. Uh, another really good example we had uh, this summer, we had a, a program with the uh, Minnetonka School District. It was, uh, it was the middle school, uh, you know, the junior high age kids. Uh, that uh, we ran a program for them uh, in conjunction with the school district. I mean, this was, you know, a sort of a shared, uh, a shared funded and shared, uh, you know, approach in which it was a confidence building type thing. So we had a number of things from like climbing walls to, um, uh, to archery to uh, uh, canoeing and kayaking. So it was things that uh, focused on teamwork. And if you, if you remember, you know that age of a kid is it's difficult to uh, to get I mean it's a struggle of of any kid that age you know to sort of dealing with a lot of things and so this is sort of getting them outdoors getting them working together uh, succeeding in a few things it was very popular much more pop, much popular than we thought and I, I can see an area where we're going to expand just and I tend I, I tend to ramble on these things, no. but one thing I was going to say. One of the other things we're doing is we're we're bringing our van and and that programming our programming people to a lot of community festivals. So like in in Richfield, it would a good Fourth example. Of, yeah, it was the um, it was the Pen Fest, the Open Streets. Oh, you know, we that's were, right. We were there for that. We do it at a Hopkins Raspberry Festival. You know those those kind of things. And so we. Uh, it's not just sort of handing out brochures, but we offer opportunities for people to get to know us. And surprisingly, as I, I often go and sort of hand out a, you know, maps and things like that, and the kids are more familiar with us than the parents oftentimes, because they'll say um, two things I was going to say that was uh, kind of struck me. is One of the most popular things we have now is archery. Oh, okay. And especially among girls. And I think it has to do with the whole well, you Hunger know, Games. the Hunger Games. Yeah, it's the Hunger. Right. It's, it's the Hunger Games. It's um, Brave. Uh, you know the animated oh, movie. Right. I mean, so this has become a really popular, popular thing. Um, and the, the other thing is, our, we bring animals. Uh, we have a we have a working farm. The uh, the uh, Gale Woods Farm. Farm Gale Woods. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Out in uh, Minatrista. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, we have sheep and, uh, you know, cattle and we grow things. And I mean, we share the sheep and uh, people make things with the wool and, and it's, uh, we have uh, poultry. You know, now it's a, it's a thing where we have a lot of field trips come there to watch all this and people talk about it. And it's a working farm. You know, it's not just, it's not a, a zoo type structure. I mean, we actually, we actually are functioning in that, but we're set up to do education, which is a big part of what we do. Well, we... That's one of the things we've taken on the road now. So we bring in, in fact, uh, we, went to the, we went to the state capitol 
uh, this past this past year, and you know, you always sort of you know take your uh, you know it's always a, you know it's always a little uh, it's always a little uh, nervous when you go to the Capitol to talk with legislators. But we thought, well, let's bring our let's bring our animals in, let's bring some of the things in, and so we set up outside the Capitol so that as the legislators were walking by, they'd see this, and the uh, the Speaker of the House walks by and and. Uh, with a black suit on and, and walks right over to one of the lambs we had, picked up the lamb, and I, I, I'm thinking, so I'm, so I'm thinking next year we're going to have to hand out, you know, lint brushes to these legislators. <laughs> diaper the lamb. <laughs> the lamb, so all the, the wool that gets on the suits. But it, it turned out, to be, and it gave us an opportunity to talk with, uh, talk with the state officials about what we do and what we're about and all that and, and kind of the programs we're involved in. Well, like so many things, it really is a matter of informing the public that this even exists. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, you know, until I got active in the Richfield City Commissions and whatnot, that's when I started learning, other than remembering there was something on the ballot that I had to vote, vote <laughs> Way for. Way down at the bottom of the ballot. Yeah, like, there's, there's probably my name you saw, because I do represent most of Richfield. So right. That's good. So it, it, it's super, because... I don't know, this farm kid kind of believes that we've lost something. It used to be, in, you know, 100 years ago or 75 years ago, even if you lived in the heart of Minneapolis, you could take the streetcar or a bus or something and get out pretty far into a more rural setting. But now there's no way kids can do that. If their parents aren't driving or can't afford it, right. they can't find the rural area, they can't get to it. You know, and it's it's true everywhere. If you, I, I noticed you have a copy of our vision plan there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a few years old now, but it, it really hasn't changed much. But there's a, a section in there, and they they quote there's a um, uh, there was a book which I was very influential to me. It's called Last Child in the Woods. God, I've got that. I haven't read. Karen Schrag told me, gave it to me, and said, "Read this." <laughs> it's haven't. a very interesting book, and I actually had a, an opportunity to meet the author, and had a nice uh, had a nice talk with him. But his um, his premise is is that we the more we're becoming more and more disconnected with the outdoors. Yeah. Uh, and if you think back, I, w I was talking with my mother the other day, and I, I said, "You remember when we were growing up?" Um, I had to be a certain age before I could go to Woods Number Two by myself, and then uh, I had to be older to go to Woods Number Three. You know, <laughs> so it was kind of how far you could go away from your your home unsupervised. And if you think now, for any number of reasons, I mean, safety concerns. I mean, just the uh, the number of activities we have throughout. Um, you know, throughout our lives now, the kids are more wired now, and they're less connected outdoors. But the the circle that that kids are allowed to go to roam is sh smaller and smaller, and not just in the large cities. I mean, it's even in smaller towns that that also is true. And there's a there's all sorts of studies that talk about what that the implications Patience, that that yeah. has for uh, you know for mental health, for learning, for all these kind of things, and so. A big part of what we're about at Three Rivers is to, is to try to reconnect people, and especially kids, with nature so that they can experience some of those things. Yeah, and know how valuable it is. I mean, I remember, you know, when teenage years, troubles, uh, you know, there's always troubles um, <laughs> when you're a teenager. You know, being able to go out away from everybody just with the wide open sky and fields. And that was a very calming, um, healthy thing to do. And we don't give our kids a chance to do that. Either. No, we don't. We and don't. I, Everything I, is so structured and organized. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, probably for Richard Bloomington, and the park we're most familiar is Highland. Yeah. So t let's talk a little bit about Highland and what goes on there. and. Big changes in Highland over the last couple of years. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we did a, um, um, maybe I could start historically. Do it historically. We did, um, a couple of years ago, we, we made major improvements to our Nordic ski area, which is kind of on the backside. It's the, 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 um, uh, on, the uh, on the Richfield Nature Center. Yeah. Um, 
or the uh, Highland. Hi, uh, uh, behind over over the hill from Highland. Um, say it out. Richardson. Richardson. Oh, Richardson. Richardson Nature, Nature Center. Center. I'm sorry. Um, you can tell I'm getting old here. That I forget. It's actually, it's the one I've gone to, taken the kids to my whole life. Uh, the Richardson Nature Center, kind of in that area, the Nordic skiing area, was on the uh, was on was on that that side. Uh, we made major improvements to that. We we make snow and we light it now. In fact, we put in a 5K loop there. There's actually three loops for kind of beginner, uh, intermediate, kind of advanced yes. skiing. And uh, we're now drawing people from all over the country are coming to use that. Very popular among the school uh, ski teams to oh, use that. And if you think about it, we haven't had the most reliable snow. No. And, uh, and we, we do make snow in, uh, in, uh, at Elm Creek uh, up in uh, Maple Grove. And we, we make snow here now, too, uh, along, with, uh, along with the lighting of the area so people can use that. Uh, with extended periods, I've had I've had run into people that uh, from uh, not in this country even that said that they stumbled upon that now and they're they're just singing the praises. They're really only a couple that are that that well run and well managed in the entire country. So, you know that's something. I mean, those that are my age, kind of in Richfield and maybe even younger, remember. Yes, we have the skiing at Wood Lake, but what we used to have is the cross-country skiing at the golf course yeah. that used to be. <laughs> that used to be. And, um, well, I mean, I used to take my kids there all the time. I guess it never occurred to me that um, Highland and Richardson would have its cross-country. Yeah, in fact, if you, uh, by lighting it, what we've done, you might, you know, our, we have a, we have a short day during the yes. winters here in Minnesota. Yes. Four o'clock, you need <laughs> yeah. lamps. And so uh, people can come either before, you know, when it's, so it's open from uh, 5 a.m. to sunrise, and then sunset, the lighting is open, uh, is used from uh, sunset to 10 p.m. So you can oh, use yes. that for an extended period of time. And then we uh, rent skis, and uh, so it's uh, very easy to do. Like I said, it's become very, very popular, and it's for all ages and all abilities. Um, so that was opened a um, couple, couple of years ago. We made those, we made those improvements. More recently, we uh, just last month had the, had the grand opening of our new Highland Chalet for the, oh, cool. for the alpine side of the mountain. If you, you know, on the, uh, on the, the other side of the mountain from, uh, from our Nordic, from our Nordic area. Is that downhill ski? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's our, uh, so it's, you know, if you go past the, uh, past the ski jump, yeah, and then actually we're making improvements to the ski jump. Let me mention that we got a. Let me get the numbers right. We just got a. Um, uh, we just got a grant. Uh, the Minneapolis Ski Club that that runs that and Three Rivers just got a, a three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar grant to improve the the ski hill with the the jumping, and uh, we're going to be modernizing the twenty-eight, the eighteen meter, and the eight meter jumps. In that area, with that, and in, and in addition um, to that, uh, we're installing plastic matting that'll have a water system that sprinkles the area, so that can be used year-round uh, for the training and jumping on that Wait hill. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! You're going to be making snow in the winter? No, no, no! It's a it's a plastic mat that you can uh, oh, land so on. Oh, so that you can use the plastic. In lieu of snow, that, that water is sprayed on it, so that so, it's slippery. Yeah, make it slippery. And then they can, so they can use the ski jump uh, year round, especially the, the shorter jumps will be done that way, so people can well, train what and fun. not. fun! And then the other thing we did that is we like uh, fun. the ski club. I need to become a child again. <laughs> <laughs> the ski club and the um, uh, and Three Rivers are going together to put in even more money beyond this beyond this grant we got uh, that'll uh, put in a, a paved parking lot. On that on that area, if you've if you've been there, uh, yeah. when it hasn't been paved, it's uh, it's, it's it's not the best. It's pretty muddy yeah. and yeah, so, rutted in the winter time. I so remember. major improvements there on the way. Um, and I used to actually have a one of my college friends was a jumper, and I I, I thought he was crazy to be doing that, but I think <laughs> I've, I've got to get him up here to see this while uh, while uh, while he while he's still walking. I think he. Uh, 
uh, he had a few few injuries when uh, I know he's competing. But uh, the other thing that I was going to mention, that kind of the crown, you know, uh, achievement there was the uh, was the New Highland Chalet, and that's that's something that's just um, had been a long time in the works, and we finally had the grand opening. Um, I don't, if, if, if you haven't seen it, I really encourage you to go out and see it. It's, uh, it's open so you can walk through it. It doubles the size of our, our previous chalet. And I, I like to tell people as, as um, well, first of all, people you know, will say, why was it, why was it needed? And um, the old one was 40 years old and really out of date. I mean, anybody who's used it, very cramped. And uh, we needed to modernize and uh, upgrade some of the code requirements in today's day and age to do that. So working with the, uh, working with the city of Bloomington, uh, we were able to pull this off. And it's, uh, just to give you an idea, we, we serve probably about 165,000 people there every year during the, especially that's mostly all during the, the, you know, the months of the, the ski season. But uh, you know, tens of thousands of lessons, and that's really our focus there. It's uh, it's not like a, it's not like a, a ski area that is serving the general public. It's open to the general public, obviously, but it's uh, it's focused on education and training and those sorts of things, especially for all the uh, the groups that use it. There, we actually have uh, over twenty. Uh, clubs and teams <laughs> use that that hill, and we're always trying to balance, you know, the you know the demand for that because it's uh, there's only so much to, to go around. Um, uh, what I tell people is, I was a uh, I was a dad that I had uh, my kids all went through the the lessons there, and and the teams some were competitive. Um, I said that the major change you'll notice in this new um, in this new place is when you come in and walk up the stairs. So if you're familiar with those stairs, that you could not get two people by you at the same time, oh. is that they are wide stairs, and the stairs themselves are deeper so you don't trip with your ski boots trying to walk up these little stairs. So you can actually go past people and walk up and down. So that's the first major change. Uh, the second major change is when you get to the top of the stairs, there's this huge room that's you know twice the size that it used to be, with a lot more seating for people that can uh, you know while you bring your kids there and want to watch. Um, and they actually we have windows that you can actually see your kids ski on the hill. <laughs> where, the old, where they are. The old ones are the windows where you had to sort of get the one prime spot, or you had to go outside and try to see these. So I, I think it's much more parent friendly for the people <laughs> that are going there. And then the final thing is that I, I'd point out is the the food offerings are now not just not just hot dogs that are on the grill forever. I mean these are these are food offerings that. Uh, are much broader and much much better selection, healthier, but still still kid popular. Those sorts of things, uh, and a much better circulation throughout the, the whole thing. thing. The rental area, the check-in, everything is uh, is is much more functional. We had this uh, grand opening. I, I people were just raving well, as good. they were walking as they were walking through this. I I was going to mention I. Uh, as long as I'm talking about Highland, um, we also made some major changes to the uh, circulation and the parking area. So working with the city of Bloomington, uh, we expanded the, the remote, well, I call it remote, it's just down, the, down the, the street from that, expanded that area and run a shuttle. We're running, we'll be running shuttle systems there now oh. so that you don't have to, uh, and there'll be notifications that, you know, the parking lot up by the, up by the uh, chalet is filled. So uh, you don't drive all the way there, circle a couple times, have to drive all the way back, or and it's much better circulation if all you're doing is dropping your kids off. Uh, that you can, they can go right to the, to the windows to get their passes, or they can go right up to the slopes uh, if that's where they're going to their lessons or whatever they're doing. So we spent a lot of time, uh, we didn't, I mean the board, and all we did was say, yeah, this sounds like a good like idea. A good you know, idea. We, all the professionals that we hired to, to think all these things out. So it's well, a much better flow. Oh, can I mention too? Yeah. Bathrooms and changing rooms, and that's another big thing. If, uh, you know, if you've ever had to uh, try to you know, ha help your kid get their change into their skiing clothes and all that, uh, much easier to get to that. Even a, you know, an additional elevator for accessibility. We do a lot of, um, 
we do a lot of uh, handicap focused uh, programming in all of our sports, everything from like wounded veterans, uh, amputees in our kayaking programs, but skiing, you know, yeah, sort of the, uh, yeah, the skiing and, you know, uh, competing in events and things like that too. You can tell I'm pretty excited about the uh, the Highland opening. I'm going to uh, have opening, to get there so. <laughs> and take a drive out there. And as a part of, I mean, you know, in my day it was skis, you know, two skis. That's what you use. Yeah, I still have my originals. <laughs> in addition, oh, to the, I kept them out of nostalgia. I, you know, my uh, old head GS. It was the first uh, the first non wood skis I bought were uh, were. <laughs> Head uh, giant slaloms, I think. Oh, okay. I, I still have those. The kids make fun of me because I still keep them in the corner there. <laughs> um, but snowboarding. Yeah. I mean, obviously, can the people do snowboarding yeah, at Highland? Yeah, or? absolutely. In fact, a little known fact, um, we were the first uh, metro area ski area to allow snowboarding oh, and to actually really? promote Even before, that. Before um, the hills down the road? Was yeah, it? we were, uh, in fact... Um, uh, if you might remember back when we first when we first acquired that, I want to get the date right. Fifty nine, it was uh, Mount Normandale. For those of you that remember that oh, name, it was Mount Normandale. We decided to change the name to Highland Hills at that time. But then it was uh, ninety seven. Sorry, I have to keep. I'm uh, I'm getting older, so I can't remember all these dates and names sometimes. Uh, in ninety seven, we changed the names to uh, the Highland Ski and Snowboard Area. HSSA, HSSA, because we wanted to celebrate the fact that we welcome snowboarders. Well, that never really took. All of us, all of us old timers, we said, you know, we've always referred to it as Highland. So with this new opening, we thought, well, this is a good time to start calling it officially Highland Hills, Hills. again, like, uh, like everybody has always called it anyway. So. Well, that's good. I mean, obviously, it, it's, that's, I have to get out there in the wintertime just to see what's all going on. Um, I mean, I remember you used to be able to see from the cross town a ski jump. That, was that that was something totally different? Well, there's the buck that's uh, you can see. Uh, that's the that's a different. Uh, that that ski was jump. a totally yeah. different one. Yeah. Now. Okay. Yeah. But I still think, how do these people find the courage to do ski jump? I know. I know. <laughs> that's not for me. I know. But a lot of people really do it. Uh, let's see what else. Um, Oh, Richardson Nature Center offers free family fun day every Sunday. Yeah, and I... Uh, uh, that, <clears throat> talk a little bit about that, because money is an issue. It is, and that's one of the things we try to do is we realize the affordability is a, is a challenge for, for many people everywhere. I mean, it's not just, you know, Center City and that. I mean, that's kind of a mis... Uh, misconception I think a lot of a lot of people have and so we try to offer samplers and programming and things that are either free or uh, sig significantly discounted so that to improve the uh, affordability so we call it yeah free family fun day at uh, and so it's every Sunday we offer nature-based uh, opportunities for uh, for families to come out or, or individuals to come out and and use the uh, use Richardson Nature Center. Uh, just a couple examples, like uh, uh, maybe it's a, a raptor day where uh, oh. they can come and see a hawk and an owl and talk to people that, uh, you know, learn more about that. I should say when we take our animals out to visit, we, we never bring the raptors and the chickens at the same time because we think that no. that has a potential for a disaster <laughs> <It's> <laughs> to get them together in that. Yeah, but, especially but, baby chickens. <laughs> yeah. um, we have a, a reptile Sunday, so, you know, you can touch a snake or, uh, you know, different amphibians. Uh, it might be uh, cider making, you know, that um, uh, so people have an experience uh, or maple syrup uh, to learn how to how to do those sorts of things. One of my favorite things and our my uh, my oldest, our grandson really uh, enjoys going to Richardson uh, is the there's an they have a resident artist of all things. So it's oh, wow. uh, someone who. Um, who, if you've if you've been there, and I'd encourage people to go there. I mean, you don't have to live near the area, but it's 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 useful to see each of our nature centers because uh, they all are are unique. So they offer all offer something a little different, even though it's kind of the standard things at each one. Uh, and this one has uh, these plaster 
uh, sculptures, really. So it's like on the walls, so you can open little doors, and maybe there'll be a mouse in there that you'll see. There'll be uh, uh, the most recent one was I think a year ago he finished that, and it was a it's a giant toadstool that kids can actually climb on and around, and there's like little and so you see little animals that are you know kind of in hiding in different portions of this 3D you know animals. So it's a uh, it's really a fun fun place to, to bring kids yes. and and you know we, we encourage people also to use that and even our new Highland Center for uh, can you can reserve and rent those for birthday parties uh, oh, weddings yes, things like that right. uh, we had a, uh, a huge interest in the when we had the ribbon cutting for the for Highland there was a we had one little table for uh, you know the possibility of renting this for for wedding receptions things like that is it was packed I mean, we had uh, people say, oh, we didn't realize this. This is a gorgeous setting. We can do this. So yeah. I, I should mention one of the things that's very unique about Highland, too, is we, we operate that as what we call a, um, an enterprise activity. So even though we're government, and we, uh, it's uh, all the day-to-day -day operations at Highland so, uh, are paid for by the users. So there are no tax okay. dollars going into uh, to subsidize the the ski hills and the, uh, we we pay for that all with uh, lift tickets. We pay you know annual passes, uh, food sales, In uh, locker rentals, and that sort of thing. Now we do the major improvements like the chalet. We we did that was Oops. that was supported by Three Rivers, but it's that that operation is a little unique from a lot of the things we do because it uh, we do run that like a business rather than uh, rather than strictly as a as well, a, as a park it, where people where people can come and go and that's understandable i mean it's a you know they're used to paying for ski stuff <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah and um okay so we got highland in the south we got elm creek up north we've got the gay farm uh, gay woods what was G uh, Gale Woods. Gale, Gale Woods. Woods Farm. Farm uh, to the west. Um, any other major parks that we're not talking about? Well, let me get out my map here. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I encourage people, you can find us online, and we're, we're actually up doing, we're redoing our, uh, uh, our website over the next year. So it'll be much more user friendly and trail friendly and those sorts of things. But if this kind of gives you an idea, and I don't know if we can kind of we can maybe get one of those for your your broadcast, is it kind of gives you the 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 uh, a feeling for how broad spread we are. You know, all through uh, um, kind of here's where here's where we are now. Yeah. <laughs> so we have this whole area. Uh, one of the things we didn't talk about was um, our relationship in Scott County. Um, oh, yes, we have there's a, something going on there. Yeah, we have, and like I said, we, we serve many of the counties. Uh, uh, one of our major parks, um, Carver Park, um, is, in Carver. is in the Lowry Nature Center, uh, and we have, is in Carver, completely in Carver County. Uh, we have a, a unique relationship with Scott County. So we actually operate the regional parks for the county. We have a, a joint agreement with the county where we get together uh, every couple of months. It's kind of uh, a couple of our commissioners, a couple of their commissioners. We talk about you know how to manage these different parks. We uh, we're doing things together. You know, so we uh, we just made some improvements in one of the one of the golf courses down mm -hmm. there, and we split the cost of mm -hmm. doing that. Uh, they pay for Scott County pays for the operations of those parks. There's no uh, there's no uh, tax subsidy from Hennepin County mm -hmm. that goes into the Scott County parks. But I think it's a good example of how uh, government should work. I mean, that's how we should be working together and and not you know Dupl sort of I mean, yeah, more cooperatively things. rather than competition. Exactly, and you know, in fact, I just a little side story we. Uh, uh, I guess it was a couple of years ago we, we had one of these meetings with our, you know, their commissioners and our board and, and we're talking about let's, let's do some more things than we've been doing in the past. And uh, I can't remember who came up with it and they, I said, you know, should, uh, we said, well, we're really not ta ready to talk about a merger or anything like that. But, um, and someone said, yeah, we're not really ready to get married, but maybe we should talk about moving in together. Yeah. <laughs> So That's that kind of caught on. We said, we said, well, what does that mean? We said, <laughs> yeah. you know, who, who brings that. the dishes, you know, or something like, 
<laughs> no, it was more along the lines of things like, uh, well, who's going to provide the uh, public safety services? So, um, you know, we'll, we will just do, uh, you know, so right now they provide all the public safety services. So we don't have any of our, uh, our police or, or officers that are doing anything in those, which makes sense. We don't want to do both. And that's another example. I was going to say, we need to talk about, you have public and public safety. Yeah, dimension. we do have, we uh, do a lot. And I think uh, it's because, you're, you know, 50 years ago when we started doing this and then 30 and 40, you know, years ago, uh, we started doing, uh, there really was, that wasn't really available. You know, these were in very rural area. And so we, we did a lot of those services ourselves. Well, now as it's become more developed and we have different relationships with the cities and all that, uh, we said, you know, we really don't need to be in this business too. So we've worked with the uh, different oh. communities and uh, in terms of kind of who does what. And then at the same time, we, we had a long discussion about, um, you know, we don't really need a police force in the sense that like a city does. Right. You know, we don't have the same kind of issues. Um, and so we, we have been shifting over, probably people might not have even realized that, uh, to emphasize more what we call uh, community park officers. So it's, um, it's people that uh, no longer look like they're cops with, uh, you know, okay. with the big belts and the, the walkie-talkies and things like that, but they're uh, more like uh, park rangers. So they're people that are okay. available to, they still will enforce our regulations and rules and things like that. I mean, you know, you don't get a free pass if you're, if you're lighting a fire in a campground and the non, you know, when you're not supposed to be doing that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they're there to help and make sure that people feel welcomed and understand what the expectations are. Oh, that's, that's good because I noticed in the statement there was something on safety and I thought, Oh, yeah, you need somebody kind of making sure things are going well oh, in yeah. the parks. I mean, you can't get away from It's it. kind of like that uh, when, uh, when I used to manage a city, we have, I, I can never remember whether it was protect and serve or serve and protect. Yeah, At the, so I had to use to go out and look at the police car to make sure I got it in the right order, but it was, uh, I was even losing my memory then. But it was, um, uh, the emphasis is on the serve yep. part of it and what we're doing. And, and we're saving quite a bit of money, too, for yeah, the taxpayers when we, when we do yeah. that. Yeah. And obviously we want to protect the environment, and I noticed in the vision uh, statements is something that this area of the country by the end of the century will be uh, more like Kansas. So obviously that makes a difference both in what we plant and, and the animals that we see. And then there's also the whole problem of the invasive species that I know, you know, we're trying to be the gateway to keep points north from having some of these invasive species. I know carp, for one thing, we've closed one of the locks and dams. Mm -hmm. So you and want that, to talk a little bit about that? And oh, yeah, absolutely. That's uh, been a big part of who we are and, and continues to be. Um, our natural resources section is a major, major area. Um, and we deal with, uh, you know, invasive species, a good, good example. You know, it's not only the things that grow, that yep. we're trying to keep a handle on from the buckthorn and the purple loose strife and the, and the garlic mustard and all those things. Um, uh, but also in our waterways and our lakes that, that we have. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's the zebra mussels and it's all those. And, and if you think about kind of where we serve, there, that's a big issue. Um, it's obviously way beyond three rivers yes, to you know, come yes. up with that. But our, uh, our people actually uh, played instrumental parts in writing the rules and regulations and strategies for that because we have a lot of that expertise. So we work very closely with the DNR. We work very closely with the communities and their, their efforts in doing that. So, so boat inspections, things like good. that, we, uh, we are, we've been very involved in, in that. Um, and it's a, it's a challenge because uh, it's beyond just, uh, just the area we serve, obviously. The, uh, 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 the emerald ash borer, I think, is a good example where uh, it has now reached our area. You know, yes. it's decimated the forests in Ohio and Indiana and, and now Michigan, and so it's reaching Minnesota. And that's a, that's a challenge for us. We actually have our own uh, tree farm. 
Um, oh, you do. Because we have uh, very large up in the northern parts um, uh, is where we have it, and it's a very. Uh, we have so many trees. And so we have a very active uh, reforestation and reclamation and those kind of programs in all of our, our, nature, our nature reserves. Uh, we, are, we are now starting to uh, plant, because if you think ahead, you know, you have to plant trees uh, and then grow them to a certain size and then transplant them. So, you know, you have to think out 5, 10, 20 years ahead when you're doing this. So our, our naturalists are planting trees uh, anticipating what our climate is going to be like 20 years from now. So That's that we're right. not, in 20 years when we're planting trees, we don't want to be tra planting trees. And this is beyond my, my knowledge, but it's, if you think about, you know, every time you go to, every time you go to Bachman's, it'll say, uh, you know, zone three, zone four, and that. So we're, we're already starting to make some of those adjustments about what zone that we're going to need to be planting our trees and shrubs and, and things four. like that. Yeah, I mean, you don't think about the fact that, you know, you're planting a tree that's going to be around 50 years from now, and you, you have to plant a tree that's going to survive in whatever climate is. Absolutely. 50, 100 years. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, the breadth of what you guys do <laughs> is totally amazing. I mean, running, you know, tree farms to working farms to ski chalets and jumps, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what you guys do. It, Oh, and this is, uh, I mean, it's fun for me, um, but as you can imagine, we have to rely heavily on the people that know what they're actually doing for all these things. And so I have, I have learned so much uh, about the yeah, the breadth of what we do. And we have, uh, it's a fabulous place to work. We have great staff. Uh, we have, we just, uh, we just had our, our head naturalist just retired. Um, and uh He's, he's uh, difficult to replace, but we, we always do. But he was uh, known nationally for, for you know, his that. leadership and these sorts of things. To give you an idea about the kind of people we have working there is uh, the first thing John did when he retired uh, a month or so ago was he uh, rode his bike uh, nonstop. Well, he stopped at night from Portland to Portland from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine. Oh, and this is a guy who's retired. I mean, he's, you know, like my age. And, <laughs> and so that's the sort of a kind of that's commitment funny. and dedication of the people, that, the people that work there. You know, I was thinking about another area. I'm not sure how we're doing we, for we time. We've got to do it. we got that one minute left. So. Oh, I was just going to say a big part of what we do is to try to uh, be sensitive to the affordability. And so we offer a lot of things like preschool school programs where people can use. We have something called the Wonder Fund. Fund, and that's where people can give donations. We have a we have a, a foundation that people can give donations to. That we use then for these they, sorts of things to help the affordability to underwrite and give scholarships to people. So if there are programs that people would like to explore and don't feel that they can afford it, absolutely contact us, and we can always figure out a way to make that happen. Well, we're running out of time. Things we always seem to run out of time. I get wound program. up when I talk about these things. I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you very much for being on our program and sharing our time. So uh, again, thank you, John Gunyan, and we learned a lot about Three Rivers Park District. And to my viewers, good night.